afternoon. Today I'm going to be talking about our next se seminar for the Advanced Reading Group. Uh, last Wednesday we completed a 32-week seminar on ION, Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self, and next Wednesday, February 6th, 2019, we will begin our seminar on Mysterium Conjunctionis. Now, this is going to be a very major task. This is uh, Mysterium Conjunctionis by C.G. Jung, and as you see, it's one of his largest books. And I estimate that it will take about one year to complete this seminar. We conduct this seminar at 1.30 p.m. on Wednesday afternoons. That accommodates our listeners both in Europe and in California, at least. And if you're an early riser, even Hawaii. And our seminar will be informed by this book, Edward F. Edinger, The Myster Mysterium Lectures, A Journey Through C.G. Jung's Mysterium Conjunctionis. Now, uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, read for you uh, some key aspects of this. Um, let me just see if I set this up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, some key aspects of this, and uh, then we'll come back to it uh, during the seminar. So if you want to join our advanced seminar, um, please uh, send me an email to skip.conover at gmail.com. If you do that, you can already get access to the entire ION seminar, which is available on playback but it is not in the public space of the YouTube channel. It is available in our special Dropbox for the Advanced Reading Group. And so if you wish to take that seminar, you can begin immediately. Uh, the Mysterium seminar will begin next Wednesday. So uh, this evening, just to get us started and to give you a sense of this, I'm going to re be reading from Edward F. Edinger's The Mysterium Lectures. <clears throat> and, uh, and I'm just going to be reading about the first uh, 12, I guess, paragraphs of Mysterium. I want to welcome you all to a very sizable enterprise. It's quite a difficult project to make our way through this entire book. Mysterium Conjunctionis is really the summa of Jungian psychology, and I think it's safe to say that if you can achieve a really living and working relationship to this book, you then achieve simultaneously a living, working relationship to the autonomous psyche. I must warn you that there will be difficulties. It is likely that you will all fall into confusion at one time or another in the course of the year, probably more than once. This is absolutely inevitable because Mysterium is like the psyche itself. It's oceanic, and to take it seriously means to run the risk of drowning. In my opinion, this book will be a major object of study for centuries. So, of course, we're not going to master it in one brief course. But what I think is possible is that some of you will at least be able to make a connection to it that can then blossom into a lifetime relationship. My hope is that as you pour effort into it, and as each period of confusion is mastered, Love for this magnificent work will progressively grow on you. What makes Mysterium so exasperating is that every paragraph, every sentence, confronts us with material with, with which we are unfamiliar, and that's very hard on one's vanity. 
As well, you'll notice immediately the frequent use of Greek and Latin terms. Jung uses them freely, and he does it on purpose. There's a real method to all this, but it's particularly difficult for those of us with an American education, because for us, the classical languages have pretty much gone by the board. In my day, Latin was still a requirement in high school, but you forgot it just as soon as you got out, and I don't think even that exists anymore. And of course, as far as Greek is concerned, forget it. Greek hasn't been around in American education since the turn of the century, and he means the turn of the 20th century. Nevertheless, I hope you do try to pay attention to these foreign terms because they constellate unconscious reverberations. More than 50% of English words have Latin or Greek der derivations. Latin and Greek make up the unconscious of our language, and to be aware of that opens up the unconscious dimension of the psyche. So even though the majority of the Latin terms are translated in the text, I suggest you have a Latin dictionary at your elbow. Now, Greek is a somewhat more difficult problem, but for the enterprising, I would suggest that you can at least transliterate the Greek words. You can master the Greek alphabet in an hour or two, and with that knowledge at your disposal, you can then transliterate the Greek terms. There's much less Greek than Latin. This then will open up meanings that would otherwise be invisible. And let me just point out here, I thought I had it right here. Nope. As usual, I've got it buried somewhere. Okay. Um, what I will say is that if you put Greek alphabet into Google, you will find a, a table with the Greek alphabet and what the letters mean, and I urge you to take a look at that. For example, in footnote 23 to paragraph 5, we find this statement, a similar ancient idea seems to be that of the solar table in the Orphic Mysteries. Transliterated, that becomes Heliake Trapeza. Once you write that down, you can begin to make associations to those Greek words from their English derivatives. Heliake reminds of us of the word helium, the gas that was discovered in the sun, or the heliotrope plant, or the sun god Helios, so we immediately know what that means. Trapeza reminds us of the geometrical figure of the trapezoid, the four-sided thing, and we learn that trapeza was the Greek word for table. Little insights of this sort strike sparks, and if you get a number of those sparks, they create a glow. The overall glow is a psychological effect of having mastered some of the material. This light is awfully bright on me. Let's see if I can tim that, tone that down a bit. It'll take a minute. This book can't be read the way one reads an ordinary book. Excuse me just a second. Let me just see if I can get that image a little bit less extreme. better. This book can't be read the way one reads an ordinary book. It has to be worked on the way one works on a dream. Initially, almost every sentence will present you 
with something that is more or less unfamiliar, and that adds up to a whole series of defeats for the ego. But if you can disidentify from the ego sufficiently, then that may enable you to keep going. The language of Mysterium is not exactly the language of the unconscious, as it appears in myth and dreams and fairy tales. This is not a fairy tale or myth or dream, but its content, its subject matter, is the content of the unconscious, and specifically the collective or objective unconscious. These contents are communicated and mediated for us through the consciousness of Jung. Although he's talking about the objective, factual contents of the psyche, mm -hmm. he is transmitting them through what can only be called a magisterial consciousness. It's important at the outset to understand that Jung's method of approach is rigorously empirical. He lays before us with utter objectivity the facts of the psyche. These are not the facts of the personal psyche. The facts of the personal psyche are all different because each individual has his or her own life story. Jung presents the facts of the objective psyche, the transpersonal psyche, and specifically, they are the facts that manifest themselves in alchemy. He explains his rationale in a passage from Alchemical Studies. Quote, it is often impossible to establish the full range of meaning of an archetypal image from the associative material of a single individual. Hence the, necess hence the necessity of comparative research into symbols. For this purpose, the investigator must turn back to those periods in human history when symbol formation still went on unimpeded. That is, when there was still no epistemological criticism of the formation of images, and when, in consequence, facts that in themselves were unknown could be expressed in definite visual form. The period of this kind closest to us is that of medieval natural philosophy. Here, as in a reservoir, were collected the most enduring and the most important mythologems of the ancient world. Now, medieval natural philosophy, that's alchemy. He says we must turn back to those periods in human history when symbol formation still went on unimpeded. That is, when there was no epistemological criticism of the formation of images. This means one could fantasize at liberty and describe using the categories of one's own fantasy the phenomena of the outer world as seen in the test tube or the retort. One can't do that anymore in modern science because there is, to use the fancy term, epistemological criticism. When a distinction is made between the subjective source of data and the objective source of data, that's epistemological criticism. But the alchemists lacked that, so their fantasy flowed freely into their descriptions. And as a result, we have this marvelous panorama of the objective psyche unfolded before our eyes. It's that vast literature of alchemy, extending over many centuries, which Jung has mastered in an absolutely astonishing toward a force. He has condensed, ex extracted, and abstracted, and presented it all between these two covers. It's just an astonishing accomplishment. Jung says that this method of comparative research into the history of symbols is similar to the relation between comparative anatomy and human anatomy. Comparative anatomy studies the anatomical structure of various specimens in the course of the evolutionary process. When we do comparative symbol research, we're doing something analogous to the anatomy of the psyche. The anatomy of the psyche consists of images, and that's what this book is about. Here is another passage from Jung's essay, Spirit and Life. Quote, 
The psyche consists essentially of images. It is a series of images in the truest sense, a structure that is throughout full of meaning and purpose. It is a picturing of vital activities. Mind and body are the expression of a single entity. This living being appears outwardly as the material body, but inwardly as a series of images of the vital activities taking place within it. Unquote. Now, these images are not random. They are highly organized and interconnected. Although the variations of individual images can be almost infinite, nonetheless, psychic images all derive from a quite limited number of uniform recurrent patterns. These are what we call the archetypes. If we're not to get lost in the particulars of our own unconscious imagery, or in the unconscious imagery of others, we really need to have a thorough knowledge of these psychic uniformities. Only with that knowledge can we recognize them when they occur in a particular manifestation. This is not so easy because to learn about these uniformities of imagery, we have to take images seriously. And that goes against a major individual and collective predisposition to the contrary. We've all learned from our collective education to depreciate images, to concentrate rather on ideas, conceptual formations, and to assume that the psyche and the ego are equivalent. This has the effect of blinding us to the reality of the psyche as an autonomous objective entity. And I would remind you that the reality of the psyche has just been discovered. It was just discovered yesterday and nobody knows it yet. The discovery of the reality of the psyche and taking images seriously belong to the same phenomenon. They go together. You see, rationalistic consciousness is so identified with the psyche that it can't perceive the objective reality of psychic imagery. From that point of view, images are nothing but a derivative of consciousness. We all participate in this rationalistic consciousness, so let's not project it onto others. It's a problem for every one of us, and it makes the study of the anatomy of psychic images exceedingly difficult. It's hard for us to perceive mere images as substantial psychic entities, but that's exactly what they are, mm -hmm. and that's the way Jung treats them in Mysterium. The images he talks about have for him the same degree of reality as any other biological specimen, a giraffe or a hippopotamus or a turtle. It may be helpful in terms of the attitude necessary to venture into this book to consider three different kinds of thinking. In Symbols of Transformation, Jung discusses two kinds of thinking. One is directional or purposeful thinking. It is linear and willed by the ego. The second kind is fantasy thinking, the thinking of the unconscious, in which the ego lies back and goes to sleep, so to speak, and lets the unconscious follow whatever associative process it wishes. It's daydream thinking, and it's effortless. It doesn't use any conscious libido, whereas directed thinking is hard work. But there is a third kind of thinking. It's what I call network or cluster thinking, and it's really a union of fantasy thinking and directed thinking. Network th thinking Network thinking is neither linear nor meandering and associational. It's purposeful, but it is also concerned with elaborating a network of expanded meanings deriving from a central image. It is thinking that is oriented around a center and moves radially to and from that center, circumambulating it. It goes back and forth, returning to the center returning to the central image again and again, building up a rich associative cluster of interconnected images, something like a spider web. 
The result of such thinking is a rich tapestry of elaboration around a central figure. This is what Mysterium is, and if you take it as a whole, the net result is an exceedingly rich picture of the anatomy of individuation with all its interconnected images dissected out for us. Now, I'm going to share with you some images here as I go on. These are the first four images. Um, Mysterium is qu quite strictly a descriptive book. It describes the anatomy of the psyche. It is a book of facts, not theories. And it is difficult for us in the same way that an anatomy book is difficult. In the first semester of medical school, the hardest thing I had was that with anatomy. I was suddenly confronted with this sea of facts, each of which had a strange, unfamiliar name. Not being familiar with any of them, one can be inundated, and that was the way I felt until I got my bearings. I recognized something of the same feeling when I first started to deal with Mysterium. In order to grasp the facts of anatomy, one has to experience them, go into the dissecting room and start working on a cadaver. Then the facts in the anatomy book take on meaning because you can relate them to something you can actually see. Psychologically, we get the same experience from analysis, primarily from our own analysis, our own self-dissection, so to speak. Secondarily, we get it from analytical work with others, so analysis is where we dissect the psyche and lay bare its structure. I would suggest you keep constantly in mind that Mysterium is a book describing images. The operative word, the key word to this book, is images. To keep your bearings, you should pay attention to the major images in each assignment. Ask yourself, what images are we dealing with here? In some cases, it can be very helpful to draw a chart of the network of interconnecting images Jung chooses for elaboration. I also advise you to read the assigned paragraphs twice, once before the lecture and then again after. Here is my list of the chief images in the first assignment. Now, the images that I'm showing you in the slideshow here are from the first image, which is the opposites arranged as pairs or as quaternities. And so the, these images are all images from the opposites. The solar table, three is Astanis, Astanis caught in Hemarmony, <laughs> sorry, Astenes caught in Hemarmony, four is the crown, five is the pelican or magical septenary, six is Ecclesia Spiritualis, seven is Mercurius as peacemaker, and Mercurius as the original man scattered throughout the world, seven major images. Now, if one boils an assignment down to that, it becomes manageable. And then subsidiary images and associations can be subsumed under the main categories. That's what I'm going to try to do tonight and hereafter. I'm going to take each assignment and boil it down to a small list of its major images and then talk about each of them. My hope will be to render this my hope will be to render them sufficiently vivid so that they'll stick in your memory. The way one remembers something is to, to nail it down by meaningful associative connections. When you can find such connections, it will stay in consciousness. If you can't find such connections, whenever you're trying to remember drops back into the unconscious as soon as you look away. Now, I did promise my wife to terminate this video at this hour, um, so I'm going to stop at this point. 
the first, I, I'll just re-comment here though, that the first of the images that uh, Dr. Edinger is going to talk about are the opposites. And so this slideshow has been giving you different images of opposites. Uh, for example, the eagle is a flying creature and it's chained to uh, another creature that's on the earth, uh, just as an example. And so uh, what I've been doing here in this video is giving you a sense of what the issues are in reading Mysterium Conjunctionis, which is uh, Dr. Jung's major work uh, and the, his last major book. And uh, we will be discussing it in seminar in the advanced reading group over the next year, week by week. And so if you want to join us in the advanced seminar, uh, please send me an email to skip.conover at gmail.com and I will get you set up to be on the uh, notice list when the seminar is being presented and where it is being presented. We conduct the seminar on Zoom so that various seminar participants can also appear on video and make their comments. And so, as I said, in the Advanced Reading Group Dropbox, there are already is um, the entire seminar on ION, Researches into the Phenomenology of the Self, uh, which took us 32 sessions to get through. Uh, this particular book is about twice as thick as ION, so I'm expecting this process uh, to take approximately a year and so I'm just advising you in the in the general group that we're doing this in the advanced group. Now on the regular group on Monday night uh, we will be broadcasting from uh, Sammy's Italian Pizza Kitchen uh, which means that I may have difficulty watching the chat and uh, so I'm trusting uh, you, Sean, and some of the other regulars to operate the chat while I try to keep track of all the technology and continue to have conversations with our local reading group. And so this will be your opportunity, as we do once a month, to look in on our uh, collegial discussion that we have once a month at Sammy's. And so I hope to see you then. And uh, I now have to stop this or uh, find another place to live. So um, I'm going to terminate the video at this point. But thank you for joining me today.